Welcome into Big Ten today. Anthony Heron alongside the man himself, Andy Katz. We got a lot to get into on a jam packed show today. The baseball regular season is close to a close. Both lacrosse, men's and women's, the final four approaches for them. And going to get into a lot of football recruiting because whenever I'm on set, they say, let's talk some football. I'm always down for that, Andy. But the NBA Combine here in Chicago at Trust Arena, it's been a very busy week in town. What have been kind of your broader observations on what's been going on? Well, finally, we're seeing pretty much everyone show up. Victor right. Wimbanyama, who is the consensus number one pick. He'll be going to the San Antonio Spurs. That was a bit of a shocker. <laughs> uh, but we are entering an era, and there's a new CBA, where they're going to make it mandatory to show up. So it was great to see the whole sort of, you know, entire draft pool, for the mm -hmm. most part, there. And a number of Big Ten players, certainly, also, some are in the draft, some are thinking <laughs> about whether they're going to stay in the draft. Right. And to, to have the National Player of the Year, Zach Eady, there in person, having the potential to go the professional route, but also the potential to return to West Lafayette. You got a chance to talk to Zach Eady. How's the week been going for him? Well, it's interesting because, you know, first of all, Oscar Shibwe was there and is there. He was last season's consensus mm. National Player of the Year. He came back, trying to obviously now see whether or not he's going to stay in the draft. But we've said this before, Anthony, on this network many times. It's unfortunate for Zach Eady that he wasn't born 20 years ago. Yeah, right. Because there right. would be no discussion. <laughs> he would have been a top five pick without question. Go back to that Greg, Greg Oden era. Um, that's not the case right now. Mm. He's really deciding between whether or not he's a second round draft pick, which is really what he is right now, mm. or does he go back try to lead Purdue past FDU from last year where they ended abruptly as a first-round pick, win the Big Ten again, and try to get further into the NCAA tournament, maybe win the National Player of the Year. We'll see if all that can happen. We don't know what he's going to do. The big question, though, and I asked Zach this earlier in Chicago here, who's in his circle in terms of his decision-making? Zach, how much has Matt Painter been this counsel for you and will he be part of the deciding group before you make a decision? Um, I think uh, Painter respects me enough that he, he knows it's my decision. Um, he respects that it's my decision. Um, I think no matter what I do, he's going to be happy for me whether I come back, obviously, or if I leave, I think he, he would just shake my hand. He would say congratulations, you know. Um, just being a, a kind of Purdue guy in the NBA helps Purdue at, uh, in a kind of backwards way as well. Um, so I think uh, Painter respects me enough. He respects uh, Mark, my agent. Uh, that he knows uh, whatever decision I make is going to be the right decision. Humor me, if you come back, what does this Purdue team look like next season? I mean, it's the same team we had last year, which is where our freshman guards get to be sophomores next year. They're, they're a little stronger, a little faster, uh, a little more confident. Um, but, you know, we're, we're a team that we, um, we were mo one number one most of the season. Uh, we're number one seed. We had a really good regular season. We um, won our Big Ten Conference by three, turn three games, won our conference tournament. Um, you know, it's the same team that's coming back. Nothing's changed. There's some folks who might joke that Zach Eady was maybe born a bit too late because of, of where he's at. I mean, the spectacular season he put together, but his professional journey, you know, is just going to be different than it would have been if he was a generation or so prior to right now. But that being said, the game, the rules around intercollegiate athletics have evolved as well. So how could NIL end up impacting whether or not Zach Eady stays or goes? Well, I think it's going to be a major decision because the basketball, we kind of know. As I said, he's probably in the second round as a seven foot four big, even though he's the best player in college basketball and was this past season. But he's from Canada hmm. and he's there at Purdue on a student visa. This is an issue across all college athletics right now for international students. There are senators working to try to change this in Washington, to change the rules of a student visa, to allow international students to make money, hmm. essentially with a work visa, if hmm. you will, to adjust that student visa. There is definitely a consensus that something will be changed in his advantage. You know, the way he got some NIL money was basically back in Canada. We saw Kentucky do this with Shibwe in the Caribbean. Uh, same with UConn with Adama Sanogo in the Caribbean. These are international players trying to find different ways for them to make money outside of the continental U.S. Uh, I think they will get it done in some form or fashion. It's obviously a bit of a promise for him to come back based on this, but he certainly has a good chance to make significant amount of money in West Lafayette if he returns and also get Purdue <laughs> past that first round. And he talked about that. 
it's definitely weighing on these guys. They want to get further in the NCAA tournament. they got a lot of work to do before that, but it's definitely on their mind. And we know how deep some of the other rosters in the Big Ten that are emerging headed towards next hoop season. If Zach Eady does return, you kind of talk to him about this there in the, in the clip that we showed. How big of a favorite is, is Purdue in that potential favorite conversation if Zach Eady returns? Well, it's going to be either Purdue or Michigan State. Yeah. Um, I kind of lean Michigan State based on their experience, their athleticism at the guard position with Jaden Akins, A.J. Hogart, uh, uh, and Walker coming back. Yeah. Um, those guys, uh, I, I like them better, and I think we've seen that they had a better postseason than the Purdue guards, obviously. <laughs> uh, and really, Michigan State, great recruiting class. They would only be losing Joey Hauser. Right. And so if we get that same Purdue team back, even though they'll be better as a year older, um, you could argue that Michigan State might be the better pick. It's a really consequential week for yes. Brad Underwood as well for the Illini, Terrence Shannon Jr., the potential for him to go the professional route, a guy who's been at multiple institutions and has, has spoken, tweeted highly of Brad Underwood. So there's potential there with the COVID year for Terrence Shannon Jr. to return. But we're waiting and watching as you waited and watched in person this week. What did you see from Terrence Shannon Jr.? Well, I mean, it's hard to judge him on a five-on-five five where everyone on that scrimmage, and he was one of the players that did play, uh, and has played, you know, everyone's out there for themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, they're trying to be good teammates, but they're trying to audition for all these NBA personnel in the stands at Wintrust. And so I think it's hard to judge him just on that. And if you look back at this past season, he had great moments. There's no question about it. Right. But he wasn't dominant at his position. And there are a lot of Terrence Shannons in the NBA. So how does he distinguish himself? That could be difficult for him over these next couple of weeks for a decision. So earlier at Wintrust, I caught up with him and discussed with him his decision process. Just, just hearing good feedback from teams. Uh, if I hear a good, a good amount of teams uh, saying that I'll be good or be in a certain range, uh, knowing that, I, that I'll get um, what I'm looking for, then I'm going to stay in the draft. What have you proven to this point this past season and even in this spring? Uh, that I'm being more, right, that I'm being more consistent. Um, defending well, um, working hard, and just having a good routine. Shannon Jr. showed himself at times as one of the best open court players in Big Ten hoops last season. Do you feel like just sheer, sheerly in physical attributes, does he measure up against some of the NBA competition? No, he does, and I think defensively will be a big thing. You know, how does he measure up in that regard? And I think so his individual workouts over the next couple of weeks before mm. the end of the month, those will be critical. Who he gets matched up against when he goes to visit with some of these teams is he satisfied with a mid to late second round uh, selection? Can he get a guaranteed deal out of that? Does he become a two-way guy? These are kind of questions that he needs to have answered before he makes a decision whether or not he goes back to Illinois. And not only Terrence Shannon Jr., but Coleman Hawkins, the decision that he has the possibility of making here. If Brad Underwood were able to get both these guys back, then the Illini are again in that Big Ten championship type conversation. I know from a traits perspective, you're really high on what Coleman Hawkins can be. Yeah, I think you have to look at Coleman Hawkins uh, as having a higher ceiling. Um, the criticism of him is his offense hasn't matched his energy, his defense, his rim yeah. protection. So he's sort of scratching the surface offensively. <laughs> So the big question is, and I, and I asked Coleman this exact thing, sort of essentially, where are you in this draft process of what you need to prove as to whether or not you're going to stay in the NBA draft? I'm at the draft combine. Um, just focusing on being a pro, whether it's off the court, on the court, uh, handling my business there. I haven't really uh, thought too much about uh, going back to school, but I know it's still an option. Uh, so kind of just handling things like a pro. Um, been working out hard every day uh, and just getting better. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. So kind of just focusing on that professional level as of right now and then uh, getting feedback and seeing how things play out. I think that's uh, the biggest thing for me right now. What is the feedback that you've heard to this point about how you can improve your game, whether it's to get to the NBA or a next season at Illinois? Yeah, um, you know, teams love my playmaking, my facilitating. You know, they like how I don't have to have the ball in my hands to do things. They like how I can, you know, kind of create advantages, do little things that help offensively, movement without the ball. Um, and just like my IQ, uh, being able to make plays, like I said, without the ball. And then they want to see just, uh, you know, spot up shooting, making shots, you know, when you're open. Uh, a lot of attention goes on the main guys on the floor, but 
once you get that shot, you know, maybe it's two, three shots a game, you got to be trusted to knock those shots down. And then uh, defense is another big thing, you know, be able to switch one through five. They like how I can do that, guard multiple positions. You know, um, it's hard to take you off the court when you can do multiple things. So that's a, kind of the feedback I'm getting right now. As nerve wracking as this time of year can be for us covering it, I can only imagine what coaches like Brad Underwood are feeling right now. The Illini fortunes hinge quite a bit on those two individuals that we just saw you speak to. Coleman Hawkins having that potential to step his game up that much more. What do you think Illinois can become if they come back? Yeah, and look, I do not want to have this come across like I'm, you know, downgrading Terrence Shannon. If he comes back to Illinois, they are certainly going to be a major factor next season. But I do think you can duplicate a Terrence Shannon easier than a Coleman Hawkins. Mm. We just saw in those highlights how difficult Coleman yeah. Hawkins can be to defend when he puts the ball on the ground and gets to the basket because Six, he's ten. so long yeah, and he's athletic. just scratching the surface. And I do think when Coleman Hawkins gets in those workouts with those teams, he could be a bit of a workout wonder <laughs> because he's going to test well. You know, he, He's going to be a little bit eye-opening because of his athleticism, his energy, his rim protection, the way he can block shots from the weak side and the strong side. So I think it's going to be coming down right to the wire. So back to your original question, I think it's, be, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of sweating for Brad Underwood because their roster literally could go in two different directions. Yeah. If they get both these guys or one of them back, if they don't get either back, you know, then it's going to be hard to predict where Illinois is going to be next season. So now I feel bad if I ask you for a prediction. I was going to happen with all three of these guys. I guess I won't put you on the spot yet. Well, all, all right, I'll answer this. I think Edie comes back. And I think only one of the two line Whoa, okay. I don't know which one yet. <laughs> I just don't know. Well, I don't, your phone's already blowing up. I know. So we'll see. I mean, maybe by the time we have you back Going later the in the week, show. I thought for sure Shannon was going to stay and Hawkins was, was going to come back to Illinois. Now I'm kind of feeling it might go the other way. Oh, man. So much develops <laughs> while they're on the court at the NBA Combine. Welcome back to Big Ten Today. It was all love for Northwestern women's lacrosse on the banks of Lake Michigan as they knocked off the Wolverines to advance to the NCAA quarterfinals. Tonight, they'll face Loyola, Maryland for a Final Four berth. And to break it all down, we've got one of our favorite analysts here, Mark Dixon. He, he breaks down both the women's and the men's games in lacrosse. You can check out his podcast. He's all over the place, even calling games here in the NCAA tournament. It feels fitting to start, Mark, with the number one overall seed in the women's NCAA tournament, Northwestern. We've gotten a chance to, to talk to Kelly Amante Hiller and just get a sense for not only the history that her program has put into place, but, but where she feels like this current team is at right now. And it, it feels odd to say that they haven't won a national championship at Northwestern in over a decade, but do you think this season squad is positioned to reset that clock? Without question, when you look at this Northwestern team, they were the, the most dominant in the Big Ten. And now we're seeing that shake out a little bit in the NCAA tournament with Northwestern being the only Big Ten team advancing to this quarterfinal round. So, you know, they're loaded on the offensive end. They've got terrific uh, presence at the draw circle. They've got an athletic and a fast defense. And I think they've got the chip on their shoulder from a year ago where they coughed up a big lead in Baltimore in the national semifinals. And they got Izzy Skane back. She wasn't in the lineup last year due to an ACL injury. So you mix all those things together with their talent and their attitude, you know, a little bit of swagger to the Wildcats this year, maybe more so than, than in recent years. I think that all kind of, uh, you know, mixes up into Northwestern being not only a prohibitive favorite to make it, to the national semifinals, but to potentially hoist the gold, uh, you know, next weekend. And we'll see whether Aaron Korkendall or Izzy Skane, like you referenced there, if one of them wins the Tuaretan award after the season ends here. But on the men's side, you know, where Northwestern women, they've got all the history associated with them. The Michigan men, not nearly as much here. And Kevin Conry, and, and speaking to him recently, I've really gotten the sense that he feels like his team is growing and beginning to peak at the right time. What are some of the main areas you, you've seen the Michigan men get better to get them to this point in the season? I think one of the things is defensively. Uh, when we talk about Big Ten men's lacrosse, defense, there's so many great defensemen in the league, and I don't think I did a good enough job of talking about the Michigan defenders uh, throughout the season. But we've seen Andrew uh, Darby in particular in successive weeks get the better of T.J. Malone from Penn State, the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year, uh, Braden Irksa, 
the um, uh, the Big Ten uh, freshman of the year. And then last weekend in Cornell, C.J. Kirst, the Tuareton finalist. Darby has been tremendous. Uh, also, the goaltending, Hunter Taylor, inserted into the game at halftime of the Big Ten semifinal against Penn State with a score 10-8 in favor of the Nittany Lions. He came in, made eight big saves, and he hasn't looked back. He was tremendous against Cornell in the quarterfinals with 16 saves. So those are two areas, you know, the goalkeeping and the, de- the defense for Michigan. But the one big thing, Anthony, their confidence. I, I use the word swagger with Northwestern uh, when talking about the, Nor- the Wildcat women. Michigan's men's team has been unflappable here late in the season. No matter what's thrown at them, whether they're at home, on the road, they do not blink. And I think that confidence and that swagger is what is a difference maker for Michigan, particularly late in tight ball games. And they've got, you know, their veteran, Peter Thompson. He was the only player in their lineup last week that had any NCAA tournament experience ended up scoring their game-winning goal. But I'm wondering, with them facing the number one overall seed here in Duke, is their inexperience, that relative inexperience throughout the lineup, is that one of the main concerns that someone might have in facing a team like Duke? You know, it's kind of funny. When you think about Duke, Michigan, my mind immediately goes to the NCAA basketball championships decades ago when you had the (laughs) Fab Five against Leitner and Hurley. I think you can kind of equate this matchup to that, you know, the diaper, uh, the diaper brigade in terms of NCAA tournament experience versus the juggernaut that is Duke. But again, this Michigan team doesn't know any better. You know, they didn't win a conference game a year ago, 2023. They're Big Ten Conference tournament champions, and they are in the NCAA tournament, winning their first NCAA tournament ever in the NCAA quarterfinals now against Duke. So I think that, that confidence is going to be huge. Also, they've got a tremendous face-off tandem in, uh, in Justin Wheatfelt and um, and uh, Nick Rallette, who are terrific. They present problems at the dot for the, the Blue Devils, who have an incredible face-off man in their own right, Jake Naso. Um, and let's not forget, Anthony, this is a team that went on the road last week against Cornell without one of their leading scorers, Ryan Cohen, who missed the game due to internal matters uh, with the university. So is he back this week or not? They proved they can win without him and players like Peter Thompson stepping up, uh, Jake Bonomi. We know Michael Bain. We know uh, Josh Sawada, but that secondary scoring, it's been there for Michigan. And I don't think this is a team that knows any better and, and doesn't really feel any pressure right now. And we're going to watch Penn State face Army, and Army was able to take down Maryland. They got off to a really quick start against the Terps by dominating faceoffs early in that particular matchup, and Penn State has started slow in a number of games this season. How important will just something as specific as face-offs be to make sure that Penn State gets off to a quick start? Penn State is a team that needs to have success at the face-off dot to feed their offense and get them into a groove, get them into a rhythm. So I think that uh, Chase Mullins at the face-off is going to be have to be big against Will Coletti for Army, who went toe-to-toe with Maryland's Luke Weirman a week ago. Um, they're, they're tough. And, and the thing about Army, too, is they're so disciplined offensively that if they can control possession, they're going to control tempo. They're going to really bleed that shot clock down with long, long possessions and try to tire that Penn State defense out. But one advantage Penn State has in this game, they've been here before. Uh, 2019, they were in the NCAA quarterfinals and then it advanced to the program's only national semifinal appearance. So I think that experience is going to be huge. However, having the ball and being able to control the faceoff dot is going to be gigantic for Penn State this weekend against a very talented, very disciplined Black Knight ball club. Now, Johns Hopkins in the previous round, they got off to what would be considered a slow start, just tied after the first at three and then exploded for a nine nothing run in the second period last week. I don't know where that exactly came from, but it was special to watch what they did. They haven't faced the Irish this season, but they've seen Notre Dame face three other Big Ten squads. Is there something within that scouting report that can maybe allow Hopkins to have sort of a hot streak as we saw them have last week? Well, you know, it's kind of crazy, Anthony, when you think about last year, Penn State and Hopkins both had rough seasons. Now they're both in the NCAA quarterfinals. And how about the preseason poll for Big Ten men's lacrosse? Maryland, Ohio State, Rutgers, one, two, three. And then you had Hopkins, um, Michigan and Penn State, four, five, six, and the four, five, sixes are the ones that are still standing. So just 
speaks to the depth and the prowess of Big Ten men's lacrosse. But didn't, getting to your question, this is a Hopkins team that is so tough mentally and physically. So they're capable of going on the scoring runs that we saw last weekend against Bryant. It's just a matter of clicking offensively. And I think there's two guys that are key to that. And it's Jacob Angelus and Russell Melendez. And both had big days last week. Melendez set a single game scoring record uh, for the Johns Hopkins Blue Jays in NCAA tournament game. And you think about a program that's been playing for over a hundred years and the success that that Hopkins team has had uh, through the, through time, that's pretty darn impressive. But Hopkins and Notre Dame share a rich postseason history, especially in the quarterfinal round. But I think that Hopkins, when you look at the the Notre Dame team that beat the Big Ten opponents earlier this year, yeah, you might take a little bit from that. But you have to kind of get with what their latest body of work suggests. And I think that's what the Hopkins coaching staff is going to focus on. And, and the focus starts with the Kavanaugh brothers. Pat and Chris on the offensive end are absolutely explosive. They've got the best goaltender uh, in Division One lacrosse and Liam Entman. So I think that Tim Marcio for Hopkins – matching the effort of Entman being on top of his game in terms of making saves. And that Hopkins defense with all Big Ten performer Alex Mazzone leading the way, how can they neutralize Notre Dame to not allow the Irish to go on big runs um, to, to get distance between themselves and Johns Hopkins? Because Notre Dame could potentially be, outside of Virginia that Hopkins has played this year in Penn State, probably the most explosive team offensively that they faced in 2023. And that game will feature the third of three Big Ten teams to make the quarterfinals. Who knows? All three will have an opportunity to try and make the Final Four. Such an impressive season already, and it continues for the Big Ten, Mark. We know you will continue to cover it closely, and we'll watch your coverage all over the place. Thanks for your time, man. Great. Great being with you, Anthony. Always talking about lacrosse and, uh, you know, Big Ten, prime opportunity to get to uh, Philadelphia. Right now, as we know, eight teams will make the Big Ten Baseball Tournament. So that blue line, that's what denotes who are in the top eight. But on the whole, conference championships still on the line. There are six different teams still in the mix to try and get the top spot in the conference. And when you look at the blue line, there's four different teams that could end up being either in or out of the Big Ten Baseball Tournament. So this final series of the regular season, huge implications both at the top and in the middle of the Big Ten standing. Scott Pose here with me right now to break it all down. You're going to be on the call of one of those games tonight. Scott, we'll discuss that in detail in a moment here. But I'm, I'm curious about th those top six, having six teams at this point in the regular season, still with a chance to be in the top spot of the conference. What does that indicate to you just about the depth of Big Ten baseball? Well, it speaks to the parity of this conference. The coaches have done a great job of bringing in the talent that re is required to compete on a national level. And we're seeing that play out at the end of this season and we have the conference tournament up in next week and teams are trying to make their case to get into that and of course the NCAA bids that are after that but still yet yeah, the championship is on the line and we're going to find that out this weekend which is going to make it a very exciting weekend of baseball. And with, with Indiana you know they're a team who got swept not too long ago by the Maryland Terrapins so both those programs really the, the two main ones vying for that top spot but Maryland has the tiebreaker for obvious reasons, but Indiana has been rolling ever since. What have you seen change in the Hoosiers? Well, Jeff Mercer said that that team, it probably was the best thing that happened to them because he has a young team. He had some injuries, so young players are playing, and he's been preaching little things. Maryland did all the little things right to sweep Indiana, hmm. and they saw that firsthand. And in order for them to get to where they want to be, they saw how they had to play, and they made those adjustments. And that's what's led to their success, and that's why they're playing good baseball right now. And Jeff Mercer's really excited about the prospect of this team and what they can potentially do in the postseason. And between those two teams at the top of the standings, Maryland's game is up first, then your game between Indiana and, uh, and Michigan State is up next. Do you anticipate that, that Indiana's going to be watching Maryland, kind of scoreboard watching in that one? I don't know how the coaches can keep the kids from not doing that except take away their phones. I mean, <laughs> in, in, in the social media age that we live in, the kids are going to know when they have an idea what's going on. But during the game, no. And they're going to preach, take care of business as it is. And the business for Maryland is continue to do what they're doing. Maryland hosted a regional last year. They've got a lot of those players back. They're playing like an upper class team should, meaning upperclassmen, seasoned players, or they're veterans, and they own the tiebreaker. Indiana's young just coming into this, and they're facing a tough Michigan State team whose back is against the wall in a sense. If their season wants to continue, they need to take a game or two and hope to slide into that eight line. So it's going to be interesting to see how these two series play out. 
Both coaches have said, though, oh, we're not going to scoreboard watch. I know better, but they're going to try to keep their players from doing that because there's going to be a lot at stake for the conference championship. When you track some of the metrics, Maryland is the top offense in the country. Their pitching staff, which seemed like on paper was supposed to be deeper this season, hasn't necessarily performed at the level that, that some Maryland fans may have hoped for. Is this a big opportunity right now for the Terps to close out the regular season, specifically with their pitching staff, to try and really get things going headed into the tournament? Well, it is because you're going to have to have pitchers lined up, and, and that's what you're looking for. If you think about this, if a team's going to win, you're going to win your conference championship, you're going to win the Big Ten tournament, then you're going to be sent to a regional you may host like Maryland did last year. Right. But if you get by that, you're likely going to be sent to an ACC or SEC school in a rough environment, and you need two good arms at least to get you through a three-game series. And that's what you're trying to get your pitching staff to, and that's what these teams are aspiring to. They just don't want to win the conference. They just don't want to win the conference tournament. They want to go deep in the NCAAs, as it, Indiana did a few years ago and Michigan did a few years ago. But you have to ride some good arms for that. It's a good opportunity for Maryland. But Maryland has played like champions. They've got potential player of the year, Matt Shaw, at shortstop. He's going to be a first-round draft pick. He's played like that all year, tremendous year that he's had. And they're riding that. And they've got an experienced catcher in Luke Slager behind the plate, and he has leadoff for them. That lineup is good. And if the pitching can come with it, they can pose some problems in the postseason for sure. There's a few squads who've kind of occupied the middle of the Big Ten standings a lot this season in Iowa, Rutgers, Nebraska. You mentioned Michigan there, and they've really, you know, taken some jumps as a program in recent seasons here. But my Iowa Hawkeyes, I'm curious, and I know you, you grew up watching and being around Iowa Hawkeye athletics in general. But Iowa seems to me to be a team that's got some big time potential, the completeness of what they can do with the pitching staff, the depth there. And offensively, they've really come on as of late. Is that the team that's maybe been in the middle of the Big Ten that maybe has the highest ceiling? Well, you're not wrong. Everybody's bullish on Iowa for one reason. They have the arms. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need when you get into tournament situations. We're going to see it next week. And then when you get in the NCAAs, they do have two good arms. The question is, can they command the strike zone? Mm. And that's what Rick Heller worries about when he has his staff. But everybody is jealous of the arms that Iowa <laughs> has. And that's what makes them really, really deadly. And nobody wants to face them in a short series if you have to win two or three. Let's just be honest. And so they're playing some good baseball right now. Rick Heller has done a tremendous job. But after the run that Michigan went on a few years ago, there's so much parity in this game. I think any one of those teams, if they get hot, you never know. And you're just waiting for somebody to get hot. And if they do, it's kind of like the NHL, NHL playoffs. If the goalie gets hot, watch out. You never know, <laughs> right. right? So they're looking for these young kids to do that. And if a team starts to play well at the end of the year, they could ride that a long way. So I don't want to discount anybody, but I like your point about Iowa just because the arms that they have, the offense is coming around, they're a dangerous team, and they figure in. There's really three teams right now projected to get in the NCAA tournament when they're looking at the Big Ten which is Maryland, Indiana, and then the Hawkeyes there, provided that there aren't any hiccups either this weekend or catastrophic problems during the tournament, mm. they're likely in. The question for the Big Ten is, can they get four in? And the, the way that you would have to do that is this. You have to win the conference tournament. That takes the automatic bid, and then the other three are allowed in because of their great record. But one caveat to this is the way the NCAA committee treated bids last year if I'm a coach in the Big Ten, I'm not comfortable because yeah. Rutgers came in last year. Yeah. They were in a top 45 from an RPI standpoint. They had 45 wins, and the NCAA still said no. And that is really wary. It makes me wary of looking and assuming everybody's going to get in the NCAA tournament because you don't know what that wild card is, what that criteria is that the committee is going to look at. So all of these coaches want to finish strong. They want as many wins as they can so they can put that on their resume for when – they start making those decisions. And then when you look at the teams that are on that proverbial bubble, you know, to try and qualify for the Big Ten tournament, Illinois, Michigan State, Purdue, Minnesota, all in that sort of similar range there. I'm wondering who's the team that you think can maybe position themselves best this last weekend? Well, I think Mich Michigan State owns the tiebreaker, and I think that they can control their own destiny, and that's exactly what you want. You can't say enough about the job that John Anderson has done, Hall of Fame coach, with the young team. They've come on late. They still have a chance. The wild card in this, interestingly enough, is Illinois. They're done with Big Ten play. They're right. playing UT Martin this weekend, so they can't make up any ground. They've already submitted 
you know, their case to get into the <laughs> tournament, and they're at 12 and 12. So if teams can get to that 13 win mark and have a better percentage, they could leapfrog Illinois. So that's kind of a lonely position for Dan Hartlib to be in because it's rather helpless. We've done what we can do. Now we have to watch what happens. But Purdue, you could look at this and say, if I take care of business, I could sneak in too. So that's exactly what all these teams are trying to do right now. I mean, it becomes cliche when we get down to tournament time where every game matters. Well, it really does this weekend. Oh, man. And, and, and the, the drama that's going to be kind of, you know, milked by everything that happens this weekend just leads great into the Big Ten tournament. All those games in the Big Ten tournament will be right here on the Big Ten Network. Really looking forward to watching you tonight, Scott. Well, I appreciate it, and it's a fun time to be watching baseball. No doubt, man. Outstanding stuff there. And make sure you are tuned in for everything that happens in softball, as well as the regionals will begin on Friday as well. Louisville will be facing Indiana. Eastern Illinois will be facing the Big Ten champion, North Western Wildcats, McNeese State will face Minnesota, and Nebraska will be facing Wichita State. We've got the college football playoff matchups that the Big Ten participated in in tennis, so why not talk to Alan True of 24-7 Sports and talk a little bit of football recruiting here. And Alan, the, the way that the Big Ten has been able to kind of continue expanding its recruiting footprint, we all anticipate that there's going to be ways that can continue, but I'm wondering just from a broader perspective, with us being kind of a few years into the transfer portal now, are you seeing any ways that the transfer portal and veterans being able to switch teams, is that impacting the timing of how high school commits happen? Yes, it is. I mean, I think the process was already moving earlier before that. Um, kids were able to take spring official visits. A lot of kids were starting to commit even without taking official visits. They were committing after their unofficial visits. And so I think the transfer portal has only added fuel to that fire. Kids know they don't have as long to wait. They can't go through the process as much. There's going to be guys who take their spots. Schools now over offer guys and tell them, you, you know, you better commit before these other guys jump into the class. And so I think that all of that put together has sped up the process. And that's why you see some schools with already some pretty filled out classes right now in the Big Ten. And Michigan and Jim Harbaugh, they're, they're no stranger to success on the recruiting trail. Top five classes, top 10 to 15 classes. Alan, right now they've got the number one class in the entire country. I'm just wondering, is the, the recent success here over the last couple of seasons, is that the main cog in what we're seeing now from Michigan reaching new heights in recruiting under Jim Harbaugh? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that's a big piece of it, although they had the success two seasons ago with that playoff, that first playoff appearance, and people thought that last year's class would be ranked higher than it was. So I think it's the doubling up of that two years in a row. I think it's the amount of players they've put into the NFL. And then I think it's also Jim adding some really dynamic recruiters to the staff. I think that has helped, and they now have a lot to go out and sell. So I think it's the perfect storm of the staff and what they are able to go out on the trail and talk about right now. But certainly I don't think they have this class right now without the success they've had on the field. And no surprise, Alan, from Ohio State's perspective, a couple of five-star wide receivers yet again. We're just seeing that on an annual basis from Ryan Day and, and his staff that they put together there. And they're at number three in the country right now. Still an exceptional class the Buckeyes are putting together, and there's still time here. But where do you think maybe Ohio State might try to focus to see if they can climb from three and maybe get back into that top spot? Yeah, they have some big fish still on the defensive side of the ball. So you mentioned the receiver class they have right now. They have a highly ranked quarterback committed in the class. But I think if this class is going to jump up and overtake Michigan, it's going to have to come from the defensive side of the ball. And they have some big fish that they're still recruiting. Aaron Scott, an in-state cornerback that Michigan and Ohio State are battling over. Bryce West, another four-star cornerback that they're battling over. They're going to get Sammy Brown, a five-star uh, linebacker, on campus for an official visit in June. They're going to get Justin Scott, a five-star defensive tackle, on campus for an official visit in June. They're going to get Williams and Winery likely back on campus. He's a top five overall player in the country uh, on the defensive line. And so I, I think where you see meat still left on the bone for this Ohio State class is on defense. I'm sure Buckeye fans wouldn't mind that at all. Give Jim Knowles as much talent as they can muster. Now, in State College, for Penn State, they've got a top 15 class rolling right now. And the way the offensive line performed on the field last season, we saw some growth there after a couple of years where they'd struggled up front on offense. And the recruiting class they put together last year was impressive as well. It seems right now there's still a focus on the offensive line and recruiting. Does that show that maybe them turning a corner up front on offense, that something sustainable is being built there? 
I think so. I think they've done a really good job recruiting the position and starting to develop that position. It really paid off last year, as you mentioned, in that class where Javen Williams and Alex Birchmeyer were two of the top signees at that position in the entire conference. And I think those guys are going to end up being stars for them. That's carried over into this class where two of the top three commits right now are on the offensive line. Donovan Harbor was a big pickup from out of Wisconsin who could have gone a lot of places around the country. And I, I don't think that it's a mistake. That's a position that they had not gotten top guys at prior. And they've done that the last few cycles. They're bringing in really good skill talent. You've got a couple of stars there at quarterback and at running back. And now they're investing in putting the guys in front of them. And I think that at the end of the day, the Big Ten is still a conference where you have to win up front. And uh, Penn State's arming up to be able to do that. And the teams we've talked about so far, not only three of the tops in the Big Ten, three of the tops in the entire country and their productivity on the field. And one way that, you know, we see Ohio State continue to get more five-star quarterbacks. Now Michigan getting five-star QBs on the recruiting trail. And of course, Penn State has one on campus already. And Drew Aller and the high hopes that are there. It feels like the way that the Big Ten is recruiting the quarterback position is beginning to enhance. And we think of the conference, the, the offensive and defensive lines, tight ends, DBs, but now quarterback. Has the way the Big Ten has recruited quarterbacks begun to enhance lately? Yeah, I think the conference has always wanted to recruit top quarterbacks, but I think that also the way that the conference is perceived outside of the Big Ten footprint is different. Quarterbacks no longer see the Big Ten as this grinded out running type of conference. And I think the success of some of the passing games that you just mentioned has played into that. I think the success of uh, Big Ten alums at the position you can look at Tom Brady, you can look at Kirk Cousins, and then you go right to C.J. Stroud being a high pick this year. I think that old perception of what Big Ten football is has changed when you see the amount of skill talent that's been drafted and certainly the success of the quarterbacks who have come out of the conference. And I think that that style of play has shifted and allowed Big Ten teams to go out and recruit a higher level of quarterback. So I don't think that's by mistake, and I don't think it's going to stop because I, you see some of the guys that are already committed in this 2024 class, and then you also see – who some of these schools are recruiting in the 2025 class. And I, I think that certainly the mindset of the conference has shifted, and I think the perception has as well. And Alan, of course, several new coaches in Big Ten football right now. And I think a lot of us are really curious how they attack the recruiting trail. Wisconsin with Luke Fickle, Nebraska with Matt Rule, and of course, Purdue with Ryan Walters. What stands out to you amongst those three programs? Yeah, first Wisconsin, I think they're going to attack the Midwest hard. They already have. There's a lot of Ohio ties, which is a state that previously Wisconsin would dip into from time to time. But I think you're going to see more of an emphasis there. But when you look at this class, it's still pretty classic Wisconsin. There's big tight ends, talented tight ends. There's big offensive linemen. It's still uh, that's still the foundation here. I think um, they're going to you know concentrate on the defensive side of the ball with Luke Fickle being the head coach. So the front seven guys that they're bringing in still uh, very much in the same vein of what you expect at Wisconsin, but they're going to be a force to be reckoned with on the recruiting trail. I think you saw that at the end of last year with how they were able to close the 2023 class. Nebraska goes very traitsy, which everyone said was going to happen with Matt Rule. People who were familiar with his recruiting at Temple and Baylor said, going to look for guys with uh, fast times, guys who are multi-positional guys, guys who are very projectable with upside. You see that in this class. And you see a couple of NFL legacies. So you see the NFL ties with them bringing in, uh, you know, I know Willis McGahee's son is one of the guys committed in the class. Um, Neil Smith, who played for the Chiefs, his son's committed in the class. And so I think you see some of those connections and those NFL bloodlines being brought in with Matt Rule there. And then Purdue maybe is going about things a little bit more quietly than some of the other schools, but do not sleep on their recruiting efforts. I thought their 2023 class was the sleeper class of the Big Ten, and I think they're quietly doing it again in 2024. They have a good class already committed, and they have some big-time guys coming in for official visits in June. Several four-stars are going to be on campus for officials, and so even though uh, they may not get some of the same media attention as some of these other schools, Purdue's quietly doing a very, very good job on the trail. You mentioned folks sleeping on certain programs. It seems on an annual basis, everyone tends to sleep on Northwestern. What have been your observations of the class that Fitz is putting together so far? Well, it's off to a great start, and, and they've done something unique in putting their first official visit weekend in May, which a lot of schools wait until June. So Northwestern, some schools want the last turn. They want the last at-bat. Northwestern has made theirs the first. So they just finished that official visit weekend 
last weekend and they came out of it with five commits and some really really good players dylan johnson a defensive tackle from inside the state who was going to visit wisconsin and some other programs coming up commits to northwestern without taking the rest of those visits for example they are able to get some west coast guys on campus so i think this class is starting off very strong and i think that putting that official visit weekend in may uh, was a stroke of genius. And then they not only came up with the idea, but they made good on it by showing those kids a good time and being able to start this class off. So uh, right now, class is trending in a very positive direction for Northwestern. Alan True, that ponytail game is in mid-season form, my friend. We know the football season never sleeps. We know you don't either. Thanks for your time. But for now, we've got some current Big Ten players, coaches, a team to discuss here, Indiana Hoosiers. They've got some, some players trying to make their professional bones this week as well. What were your observations about especially what happened with uh, Trace Jackson Davis and Jalen hood Shafino this week? So it's interesting. Jalen hood Shafino came into the season. Um, I think some of us projected he potentially could be one and done. But the way his season progressed, it was clear hmm. that he was going to be a lottery mid-first round type pick. And really, things changed for uh, JHS, or <laughs> Shafino, right. um, when Xavier Johnson went down. Mike Woodson, and, and Jalen told me this uh, over the last couple of days at Wintrust, that Mike Woodson basically went to him and said, you know, it's, it's you, your team to lead us now hmm. without Xavier Johnson. He took that mantle, ran with it, was a big-time scorer in big-time games for them, distributor, and right now, he doesn't need to work out at the Combine in terms of scrimmages or anything like that. He's a known commodity. He can run a team. Uh, and he's going to go somewhere, I think, in that late lottery, maybe the teams. Wow. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis, you know, great example. Uh, and, Anthony, you know this happens in various sports. When you bet on yourself, <laughs> and he did that. A year ago, in this same turn, uh, event, he got covid he was supposed to participate in the Combine. Because he got COVID, he withdrew from the Combine and withdrew from the draft. Came back to school, became an All-American, would have been the Big Ten Player of the Year if not for Zach Eady, right. led his team to one more round, became a much better scorer, rebounder, passer. And another thing he told me this week at Wintrust was, Mike Woodson said, you know, from the weak side, go block everything. <laughs> Just go out there. <laughs> and he was not asked to be a three-point shooter, but this week in Chicago, he has made some threes and shown that really? he can do that. And I think he's going to find himself somewhere in the first round okay. late. Last year, he would have been a second-round pick. And that, that's such a, an interesting part of that dynamic, in my opinion, because there's this assumption that myself and others had, like, oh, TJD's back for another season. He's going to shoot a bunch of threes. And he hadn't had to show that during the season, but right now, scout seeing his game expand, you think it does push him into round number one? Yeah, I mean, he would not be a three-point shooter, but the ability to make right. a three, I think, is critical for his game, but also just has to keep doing what he's doing in these individual workouts at these teams rebound, defend, block shots, and score. And when you mentioned what Jalen hood Shafino was able to do after Xavier Johnson was out of the lineup, Xavier Johnson will return next season. What does that do for next season's hopes for the Hoosiers? Look, there's a lot of uh, positive vibes right now for Indiana because you've got Xavier Johnson coming back, hopefully healthy. Trey Galloway, who was the ultimate glue guy, he's back. Uh, Khalil Ware is a transfer from Oregon who never met his potential, but he's a big-time Front court player, shot blocker, rim protector, and then Mackenzie M.G. Bucko, uh, uh, Bacco, excuse me, M.G. Bacco, mm -hmm. big time recruit they got. Originally was maybe going to go to somewhere like Duke. He's a big time talent for them. And then Malik Renu is back. It's a really good starting five <laughs> for Indiana. A lot of high hopes in Bloomington yet again.